thanks everyone for coming. I know it's a really, really nice day on a Saturday lunchtime and you chose to spend it with me, so thank you. Um, but welcome to my talk, we have C2 at home, uh, leveraging Microsoft C2 framework. So a little bit about myself, my name is Garrett Foster. I am a senior consultant on the adversarial simulation team over at SpectreOps. Uh, prior to that, I was on the attack and pen team at Optiv. And then uh, before that, I was playing kind of uh, alert whack-a-mole at Perch Security, working as a SOC analyst. Uh, my Twitter is at Gare Foster. I guess it's X now. Um, I, whatever. Um, I'm a perennial, you know, kind of like retweeter. I don't have a lot of content on there, but if you did want to follow me, that's that's my handle. <clears throat> so on the agenda today, uh, we're going to talk about what Microsoft C2 framework is, uh, in my opinion, and essentially that uh, it's SCCM. Um, and then we're going to talk about a service that's installed on the SCCM that's not very well known, called the Administration Service. And then I'm going to share some, some updates to a tool I wrote called uh, SECM Hunter. And um, before I jump into that, there's a lot of prior work in it that I'd like to acknowledge first. Uh, so Chris Thompson, Matt Nelson, Dwayne Michael, they're all uh, co-workers of mine over at Spectre have done a ton of research on SECM and related topics. Uh, Brandon Colley is over at uh, Trimark Security. Christopher Panayi um, is at NWR Cybersecurity, did a great talk at DEF CON 30. And then Dave Kennedy and Adam Jess over at Trust Tech. There's a ton more, but if you want to do some more research on this topic after this, after this talk, follow any of them, look them up. It's, it, there's a lot of good stuff. Okay, so Microsoft C2 framework, we kind of kind of cover what SCCM is in a way. So we're gonna go real, real high level and then try to, to move off, off of that. So SCCM is just device and application management for an enterprise at scale, right? So to, to kind of give you a kind of a picture of what that looks like is that we're all users, we all have our devices, right? Each one of us probably has a laptop, cell phone, whatever it may be. And for me as the administrator to manage that, I'll use something like SECM. So those devices and users are organized in SECM by what's called a collection. So you could imagine a collection is, we're in track two, so this is collection track two, and then you have collection track one, which is the other room, and all the other users and all the other devices, and those are separate, right? And then you have some pretty much static components, which are the primary and uh, database server, primary site server and database server, the management point, and a distribution point. And I'll, I'll get a little bit deeper in just a second. So to, to kind of understand how it works, you have to really understand the architecture. So I want you to put your, your Red Teamer hat on and, and kind of think about how you would stand up Red Team infrastructure, right? So I refer to the primary site server as the team server. That's the, the, where you're operating from. That's kind of where you want to hide everything and, and have no connectivity whatsoever. So it's just us operating, there's no visibility. So, and then the distribution point I would refer to as the payload host. So this is where you're gonna host all of your software, your malware, whatever it may be. And then you have uh, a management point, and I refer to these as your redirectors. So this is what you're gonna put in front of your team server to make sure that the traffic that's coming in is what you want it to be. And then right there at the bottom is the clients, and that's where your victims are. So essentially, if you walk your way up, you'll see that the clients only communicate to the management point and distribution points. And those from there communicate to the primary site server and that's where all of the commands are trickled down. <clears throat> so if you were to log in to SCCM as the administrator, this is what you would be met with. So when you, when you actually sign in, over on the left is your ability to navigate SCCM and that's where you're gonna see your collections. So each of the users and, and the devices are in the default collection when they're joined, and then you have the option to kind of split them out. Um, a, kind of an interesting caveat with the collections is you can only have devices in, dev and, and devices in a device collection and users in a user collection you can't overlap. You can have them as members of multiple, but no overlap. And then I highlighted the devices. So these are all of the clients that are enrolled in SCCM. But what's fun is if you look to the left of it, you'll see that the icon is there. So you, the, the green check mark indicates that it's enrolled, that it's calling back, and, and that it's a, actually active on the network. And I was lucky enough to grab one where I had the question mark where that's the client is up, but is not necessarily uh, calling back in the default poll rate. So SCCM has a poll for every 15 minutes that the client checks in and just asks for policies. <coughs> so. There's a lot of power in this tool. It's basically got system level access in every single client that is enrolled. So from an administrative perspective, that's great. I can manage all the software in, 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 the, in the enterprise, but then from an attacker perspective, that's great. I can handle everything in the enterprise. So what's really more fun about it is the entire thing is very, very vulnerable to takeover. So Chris and I have published a few blogs uh, kind of demonstrating the ability to do so, to compromise the entire infrastructure. Um, 
So that was over the last six or seven months, I believe. And, and recently, uh, Chris published another blog that made us learn that it's not just a site takeover, it's actually an entire hierarchy. So if you were to compromise a primary site server and it's a member of a hierarchy, that change gets replicated down, makes sense, but also gets replicated up. So if you become an admin in the middle, you're admin everywhere. So that's the perspective that we're gonna take now. Like, okay, so what have we done? We're admin, what can we do with it, right? <clears throat> so it's already been demonstrated pretty heavily that if you have control over this, you can push out malware, you can push out whatever it may be, basically anywhere that you choose to. Uh, Dave Kennedy, his talk at DEF CON 20 was basically him popping shells and it just rained shells left and right. So that's awesome, it's a lot of fun. But what else, right? So sometimes we get uh, different perspectives that we want to take so, and find new different uh, tactics so, and, and ways of doing things. So my, I, I focused heavily on, on what can I do from a red teaming perspective. So it's not always about, okay, let's go in, let's grab DA, and then just we're done. So a lot of red teaming is very, very goal or action on objective focused, right? So it may not necessarily be DA. The client may want you to say, hey, can you get to our backup servers? Or can you compromise one of our users to get control over our CI, CD pipeline, right? So user hunting is very, very valuable for us. So, so if we can find out where a user is, what device they're using, where they're logging in, that's awesome. And SCCM makes it very easy to do so. You can query for it and then actually find out where they're, where they're logging in from. So, and then there's a tool called CM Pivot, which is extremely valuable. Um, so essentially what they, the way that tool works is it uses a protocol called uh, Fast Channel. And essentially the way that works is so all the clients that are enrolled, when you execute a query from CM Pivot, it sends a few packets that says, hey, wake up, ask for policies, and then we'll send them out to you, and then it'll, it'll run whatever commands you had. And then you also have the ab uh, ability to create and execute custom PowerShell scripts on endpoints anywhere in the environment. So if it's active and it's enrolled, you can create scripts and run them. Okay, so hopefully this works out because the videos on, on PowerPoint are rough. But I'm gonna try to walk through uh, kind of what it looks like here. So in, the first step, I'm gonna show you how you can query for the user. So you're the administrator. I wanna go find out where a certain user is, uh, is set as the primary user of that device, right? So it's very simple. You just run the query. You add the primary user, search for PC3 your user, and then you get the query back, the P and it's PC3, so great. So now we're gonna start CM Pivot, and I'll show you kind of the power of this tool. So if you look here, I'm gonna scroll down, and these are all different queries on the host that you can look up. So if it's enrolled in BitLocker, you can look at services, you can look at processes, you can look at local administrators. A ton of information, and you know in this industry, information is king, so if we can grab that and leverage it in a way, it's awesome. So that was just an example of grabbing services. So I could see what started, what stopped, and then uh, and kind of just grab that information. So here, I'm gonna show you a script, right? And I'll stop right here. So this is a script that I just put in to kind of show the way it'll work. So let's look at the local administrators group. Okay, cool. Then let's just add any user we want and then check to make sure that, that, would, that it, it completed, right? Obviously you wouldn't do this, but it's a good demonstration, right? Um, so we'll, we'll go back to PC3, because that's where we're going after we want to grab the, the PC3 user. So you run the script, and then after a short time, you'll get the actual results back. So it'll come in JSON and then RAW, and I know this is difficult to read for in the back, but I know there's another TV, but you can kind of see the result of the query. Okay, so domain admins, and then now we're at low priv is a, a member of DA, or the local administrators group. So interesting stuff, right? Uh, uh, different perspectives. Okay, so now I, I think I need to explain myself a little bit. Um, yes, PowerShell is IOC like crazy. You know, you don't necessarily want to run an environment, command line logging, that kind of thing. Uh, however, both CM Pivot and uh, custom PowerShell scripts are run from the same directory. And it's on every single client is this CCM script store directory. and. It's great because Microsoft <laughs> recommends that you exclude this from all of your anti-malware and antivirus solutions, right? So <laughs> we can basically live there. Um, and I'll show you why they suggest to do so. So this is a, um, just an Elasticsearch query for invoke command. Um, and this is, I only have one of my clients in my lab that are actually um, pushing logs back. So it's a Sysmon and Elasticsearch. 
So I search the invoke command, and these are all legitimate CM pivot and, and PowerShell script, or the CM pivot and SCCM script results. And the reason why they tell you to uh, allow list it is because it uses a bunch of malicious looking uh, arguments. So non-interactive, no profile, and then the whole thing's base64 encoded. So if you've ever worked in a SOC, done incident response, you see alerts like this cross the line all the time, and Microsoft makes a ton of them. So not only are you potentially gonna follow Microsoft's recommendation, but again, I need to stress this is one client over two days where me just playing. If you're at an enterprise in scale and you have thousands of devices, imagine how many of those are gonna come across. What's the likelihood that you FP that directory and you never see it again? I think it's pretty high. <sighs> okay, oh, I missed that one piece. So that blob up there is actually from uh, Microsoft's uh, website where they recommend it because they want you to allow these features to run without any kind of interference. So I'll just add my features too. Okay, so the administration service is, um, man, I, I, I'm a big fan of this. So the most recent blog post that I shared is this admin service is a, it's an API that grants access to SCCM over HTTPS. It's awesome. Um, it's vulnerable to NTLM relaying, so if you can relay the correct, correct uh, account, you can actually compromise SCCM with it, and, and then you're off to the races. But its intended purpose was to give um, administrators the ability to create some custom applications. Uh, so if you had, like, a lot of SCCM is very compliance-focused, right? So you want to have uh, metrics and statistics of how things are going. So you can create custom apps that create reports, right? Everyone likes pie charts and everything else, so. Then there's a community hub. Uh, the community hub is a way to share like some really gnarly CM pivot queries for specific things. So they use the API to kind of um, transfer that data up. And then Intune tenant attached, which is interesting, and, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. It has two routes, so both of them start at admin service, and then it'll be a WMI and then V1. Um, in Microsoft fashion, it is very poorly documented. Essentially, um, if you go to the metadata for the API, it's like they copy and pasted it and put it up in GitHub and that's your, that's your reference. So um, not only that, it's not very well known. Um, if you search it on Reddit, there's a lot of posts, like there's a few power users, right? Um, but there was a, a book called Config Manager Unleashed and it's kind of like the go-to for uh, running uh, SECM in your environment. 1,700 pages, not a single reference to this API. Okay, so we'll take a look at how both routes look, so they're both in JSON, they're different structures, right, so you kind of get weird with how you query the data. But this is the same device on both endpoints, so um, I started playing and digging more into it, like, okay, so what would I want to do in the GUI that I can do on the API? Can I look at devices? Can I look at collections? Can I look at users? And it just, like, I would throw a dart and it would land and be like, okay, I can do that with the API, I can do that with the API. And then ultimately it was, you know, I, I can do anything I want to with this API. <laughs> so, <laughs> and since it's not very well known, that means they're not paying attention to it, right? Um, so this is where I lead into the SCCM Hunter updates. So originally SCCM Hunter was developed to uh, help enumerate the environment to build these compromise and takeover paths. Uh, but now it's, it's kind of grown a bit. So knowing and understanding this API, there's a lot of new features added. So I created an interactive C2 CLI. Um, all of the objects that I just showed you, devices, users, and, and, and so on, are identified by a unique identifier, just be a string, uh, and you can, that's how everything is called and executed against that. So I will let you interact on the CLI with that device or with that collection and then execute whatever commands you want. Um, so the CM pivot stuff I was talking about, now I'm gonna to refer to that as situational awareness. If you're familiar with trusted sex uh, situational awareness BOF collection, it's very similar to that. Just information gathering, tell me everything that's a, uh, that I would be interested in as an attacker about this host. And then the database commands. So previously I was pulling everything out of the of SCCM and then storing it locally in a, a SQLite database. Now it's gonna be if you're looking for a device, it'll check if you've already checked, like ran that query, otherwise it'll save it. So it'll, it'll do the API pull and then grab it and then save it locally. And then there's very, a lot of post X focus, right? I don't wanna be um, plankton anymore. I wanna know exactly what my game plan is after I compromise this thing. So post X, you'll be able to run a custom script. So before we show, I showed you the net local group administrators, you can throw whatever you want in a script and then run it against the interactive endpoint, right? 
Then you have the, addition, the ability to add admins. So with the relay works, you know, you could do the administrator add that way. But there's some cases where SCCM limits you on um, script execution. So by default, you have to have a secondary set of credentials to approve it. So I'm giving you the power to just add another arbitrary user. And it can be a machine account. It doesn't have to be a user. <laughs> so you can add a machine and then use those creds uh, on the command line and it'll do all of your approval for you. And then, fun thing about CM Pivot. Okay, so the way that tool works is uh, every endpoint will have a script installed on it and it's the same script everywhere. It's not visible from the GUI, so administrators can't see it, they can't go and make changes to it. It's only available from the database or from the API. Um, there is no integrity checking. It is stored in the database with a GUID, which is universal, so I tweeted out like, hey, does anyone have this GUID in their, um, in their environment? And everyone was like, yep, that's, that's the same one. And then it'll have it stored as the GUID, and then it'll have it stored as the file hash. And when it gets dropped to disk, it is named GUID underscore file hash. And <laughs> <laughs> so if you change the contents of it, and the hash will change, that's fine, but it'll write it to the disk, like your endpoints, and then it'll be like, okay, cool. Does this script line up with that, what I have? It does, cool, we're good, we'll, we'll run it. And so you can, you can backdoor that and get it pretty creative with, with things. So. So this is the new help uh, menu for the module. Uh, so essentially you'll, you'll jump in, this will be the CLI, and um, yeah, I've got a demo of how that works. So I'm gonna, again, I didn't do too bad on the last one, but hopefully this video works well. Okay, so right off the bat, you can kind of see, uh, let me pause it. See, I already, I, I did it to myself. I said I did good. Um, so I ran a command, and you can see that I'm using it to the TAC AU and TAC AP. Those are the alternate user, alternate passwords. So when you need that script approval requirement, you just have to throw the creds on there, and it'll store them so that anytime you run a script, it'll just handle the approval for you, right? So build a database. We've got a log directory. We're going to try to keep as much information as possible. Um, lots of timestamps and logging. If you are a consultant, you do reporting. Screenshots, right? Um, need to have all that stuff in there. Okay, so we're gonna start with the help command and then we're gonna run some of the data collection and database commands. So here I ran a get collection star, so you're gonna pull down all of the collections first. It's not a huge pull. Um, I think the most I've seen is like 50 in an environment and it was like a Fortune 10 company. Um, so they're global, so it, it's an easy one and then from then on you can get collection, you can run the same command for the collection ID. So we're starting to see those identifiers I was talking about earlier, right? Okay, move that. So now we're gonna look for a specific user. This is low priv and this is all coming from the API. I'll pause it after the next command right here and then we'll walk through it. Cool, right there. So. Um, just checking on the low privilege user. It's a member of SCCM, so I can pull information of it. Lots of valuable stuff, right? You can see the SID, unique username, email, all that good stuff, so useful stuff. And then the next command is get last log on administrator. Look at how bad I am with my DA account. I am logged in everywhere. So now you can go hunting for that if you were looking for a way to grab DA, right? So now you know every machine that that, that, that account is currently signed in to, so you can either try to you know, steal a ticket, get into a session, whatever it may be. Then we have the get p user, which is the primary user of PC, like, so query for PC3 user, who's our target for this as assessment, right? Where, are they, where is their primary daily driver device that they've been issued? PC3. Okay. So now we'll get to, we'll query for his device, or their device, so PC3. And now we know that the device ID is 16777226, and we're gonna interact with that. So now, any commands that we execute from this CLI are gonna be against that device. Okay, so now we'll run the PS command. This is part of the situational awareness stuff. So just what's the running processes? We'll pull that all back. Okay, so now we know what antivirus, EDR, whatever solution, if they have command line logging so we can really like think about our next steps, right? We're not doing anything malicious yet. We're doing all default living off the land type stuff that, that is always in their environment. So this, this is a fun feature. So you can actually list the file system, okay? Um, so on the command line, you'll see that it's got the device ID and then a C colon slash, or backslash. So you'll just change your directory. You'll have to put the full path. I'm, I'm not a great developer, but you can put the full path that's your there, that's uh, on that CLI, and then run the ls and then cat commands to actually look at files. So if it's a plain text file, 
TXT, CSV, PS1, whatever it may be, you can actually view that. There's a, there's a size limit to 4KB, so you can't pull the entire thing, but you can get some of it. Useful for SSH keys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, oh yeah, I did it. I knew I was gonna do it. All right. So now it's gonna run into the script. So the script just has a bunch of different commands thrown in there just to show a demonstration of, of what you could do if you wanted. Like, I'm gonna just, a bunch of net commands, whatever, and then run the script. So the way I designed the, the script execution is it will create the script, and then it will approve it with the approval credentials, and then it'll grab the operation ID, and then it's self-deleting. I don't wanna leave anything on disk, so that path, that directory, the script store directory, when the script is done, it deletes itself. When the script is done from SCCM, it deletes itself. I don't want to give free wins. I want you to work. So you can go into the logs and you can find it. You can go into the database and you can find the results. And script results only live in the database for 24 hours because they want to save space. So. <laughs> yes. Nighttime testing. Okay. So now, now we're going to pivot off of that and we're going to focus on collections. Okay. So. I chose SMS0001, which is everything. So we're gonna go after all the systems. And now, now we're focused on what I was talking about with CM Pivot. So there's a backup command and there's guardrails in place that will not let you back door the script until you've backed up the script. I do not want pull requests or like ads on Twitter saying, hey, I ran this and I broke the environment. Nope. <laughs> if you got around the, the, the guardrails, that's, that's on you. So we'll run the backup, it already exists. And then now we're gonna backdoor this script. So it's gonna take whatever I did to the script and then actually upload it and change it. So it modified it, it approved it, and now we're gonna run just an IP config command. So the script, when you, if you take a look at it, it's really interesting because there's certain WMI calls that aren't gonna work with the DLL it loads, so it has some custom stuff. So you could find one CM pivot command they never run and use that, and that's your backdoor command. So they, they, the tool will still work for their normal day-to-day -day stuff and never have a callback, but if you have admin still and you need the callback, you know which one to run. So we ran ipconfig. I backdoored ipconfig, and all it was is holding a PowerShell cradle to, to Cobalt Strike, and now I have a C2 in your C2, and I'm persistent. And <laughs> <laughs> so now you'll go back, and like good consultants, we're going to restore the CM pivot script so there's no more backdoor, and that's that. Okay, so what's next? Um, this isn't all inclusive for the post exploitation that I want to do. This is just a release that I wanted to share with everyone here. Um, I want to add support for packages and applications, which is what we were talking about earlier where the research has already been done. Um, my buddy Chris, who wrote Sharp SECM, he has a lot of support for this already. So if you're running like inline execute assembly or something with the, the, C, the C Sharp binary Sharp SECM, all this is available through there. Um, I also had some support for task sequences. So if you're familiar, like you're a recovering sysadmin who has had to support this, um, <laughs> you know how task sequences are vulnerable to this type of thing and how much power those have. Um, I do have, currently have some logging. So essentially it's gonna timestamp it and then just spit out the, the, the standard out output so that you know, if you needed to have a screenshot that you missed, which never happens, right? Um, you can pull the logs up and actually see that. And then it is Python. I am well versed in how much everyone hates Python, so I want to dockerize it and kind of take away the, uh, the issues with dependency hell, right? Um, and then one last thing. We talked about Intune tenant attach. CM pivot, script execution, it's all available from Intune. So, yeah, if you get completely kicked out of the environment and you have access here, you're right back in, so. Okay, so that was it. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening. I have, um, I have a few minutes if anyone has questions. I saw you first, right here, Hawaiian shirt. Yes, sir. So you, you mentioned uh, getting kicked out. I, I kind of wonder, it sounds like they're shooting a fish in a barrel and there's no real hope of anyone having any good security posture here. But have you actually used this or not been successful because it's been a bit knocked out? No. So the question was, have I used any of this and not been successful because it was locked down? Um, unfortunately, the answer to that is no. So at this point, you know, the, the, 
my boss, Matt Nelson, has been doing research on SCCM since like 2016, and there's, he's been shouting it already, and it, if it hasn't been changed from, from then, now I, you know, we got to keep yelling, I guess, just a little bit louder, a little bit higher. Um, and that's, that's the, the goal with this is to facilitate that. Like, so if you can demonstrate to your clients these issues, then the likelihood of them fixing it just goes that much better, especially because I feel like this, our industry overall is getting more focused to living off the land type stuff. So if you just have 30,000 system level beacons waiting for me to get them, I'm gonna go straight to it. So, um, but there are, there are a lot of opportunities for hardening, which is, which is great. So there was another question. Sorry, you're next. Uh, so what I was going to ask is from like a system analysis perspective, if you were trying to analyze it, right? Let's say you didn't follow the recommendation, you didn't shut down those folder loads. How would you even detect someone who was doing malicious behavior in, in the flow? Because I've got so many things that are going to pop yeah. at like a system administrator level. How would I identify the malicious behavior if I didn't follow Microsoft's recommendations and just click lock it out? Because I cannot follow it now that I know I need to. Sure. How do I even identify it if I've got all this? All the mess, all the noise? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's, that, that's uh, why detection engineering is a career field, right? Um, <laughs> You know, from my perspective, when I worked in it, uh, I actually talked to a friend of mine who's here, uh, Blake somewhere. Um, the hash itself, so that name, that's what I would do. And that's what he, he suggested too, is monitor that file that'll be dropped on endpoints for a change. So the GUID is universal. That will never change, but the hash will. So if I mess with it, the hash is changed. So there's your detection right there for the back door on the CM pivot. If that file name changes to a different hash, that's your alert. You can't, I, I, don't, I can't help you with the scripts. Those are, they're named the same way and they change every time. But if you want to detect the back door, that's it. And then, I don't know, good luck the rest of the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And then one more question. What, what is the minimum level of privilege that you can actually start using this? I, I can imagine that the answer is like, just basically getting your first toehold on the domain, you might be able to start making use of this. But like, what's the minimal level of privilege that you can use this to start? The SCCM abuse or this CLI specifically? The SCCM. Oh, um, well, essentially everything starts from authenticated. So if I have a credential in your environment and you have SCCM, I feel pretty confident I could go get it. Um, because there's a lot of overprivileged that are overprivileged defaults. And anyone who's supported this infrastructure knows that it's one of those tools where it works, don't change anything. And so, and that lives forever. Potentially, yes. So a lot of what it, the abuse is is that that site server machine account. Uh, I think the most common thing I see is that we'll overprivilege it enough to give it admin over all servers and workstations. There was a Reddit post two days ago that said they, they did that explicitly because it was more secure. Um, I can control that machine and send it anywhere. So if you have SMB signing disabled, I, I win. Um, and then there's the issue with like uh, the old school network access accounts where you're using a service account to push uh, installations places, but those credentials live on disk in perpetuity. So you could, you could say like it's unenrolled from SCCM, but it's privileged and I can pull it out of DP API, which is a blog post by Dwayne Michael called the NAA must die. So you should go check that out. It's really interesting. There's a lot of um, abuse potential. So, but unfortunately that is my time. I don't want to eat into the next speaker's time. So if you have any other questions, I'll be in the hallway, but thank you again so much. You guys. Appreciate it.